Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome to a brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjay Sum, and this program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program, ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, and the nonprofit Blue Marble Space. Today, we are extremely lucky to welcome back to Saganet, although she's never really left, Dr. Sarah Imari Walker. She's a co founder of our network back in 2011. She's also an assistant professor at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at the Arizona State University in the United States, and, this goes on, the deputy director of the Beyond. Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Sanjay. I'm super excited to be here and talk with everyone today. Before we start, though, it's time for our monthly background quiz, which I know you're all excited about. Last month, we had a wonderful landscape of a terrifying planet, terrifying and beautiful. Mike, if you could put it up. And I'm sure many of you recognized the surface of the planet Venus. So this uh, is actually only able to be measured using radar, which was obtained by the Magellan spacecraft in the 1990. And uh, because the atmosphere is so thick, only radar can reach the surface. And the color is actually um, deduced from the Venera landers, which are Russian landers who made it to the surface, I think a decade, a few years before, about 1986. And uh, the landers lasted an hour or two max because the atmosphere is so thick, there's so much CO2, the greenhouse is terrible. And so the machine essentially died very quickly. And so shout out to Jaime Cordova, congratulations for you guessed, the, you got it right, and uh, you are going to get all six of the astrobiology graphic novel, which are a really fun way to discover the discipline, and so please reach out to us via Twitter or other means, and we'll get your address and send those to you, so congr congratulations. And so uh, next month, though, we'll have to, you'll have to be guessing what is my background today, so uh, make sure you use hashtag AskAstrobio. And use it also today to ask your questions for Dr. Walker. And uh, if you're on Saganet, just use the chat directly. So with that, Sarah, yay, I'm so excited that you're here. I know you're very busy, so I'm very grateful that you took the time to chat with us today. What we like to do first is get to know you a little bit before talking about the incredible science that you do. And so like we like to do in the show is turn back the wheels of time a little bit. And wonder if you could share perhaps a story when you were young that kind of led you to become a scientist today. Um, sure. I, so actually, I didn't really know I was going to be a scientist until I was in college. Um, so maybe that, that's a little bit of a, a backstory. But um, but both my parents. Um, so my dad's a hairstylist, and my mom uh, deals in antiques. So I actually grew up in a really artistic household, and um, they are, were both enthusiastic about science, but not really like thinking scientifically. And so I, I went to community college for my first two years of college, and I took all the science classes I could my first year, and just like fell in love with physics. And so I remember coming home from school and telling everyone I was going to be a theoretical physicist when I grew up, and then looking at me like I was had two heads, and nobody really believed me at the time, but I just made the decision and I I was so excited about it and so I remember um, you know being 18 and starting to read things like by Fermi and Dirac from like you know and getting rid of my 17 magazine and favorite physics textbooks and <laughs> it was kind of a really abrupt transition but the thing that's been interesting for me about being a scientist is that I feel like that's my creative outlet so I didn't really lose sort of like the creativity and the artistic things that that my family really tried to cultivate as a child I just used them to try to create new ways of understanding the world and so it has really become my creative outlet. So you use your, art, your artistic background to help you kind of generate new ideas for studying the concepts of the origin of life, which, which we'll talk in a bit. But you know, theoretical physics is quite different from studying the origin of life from a broad perspective, but we know it's quite different. But perhaps you can tell us how your interest in the origin of life and astrobiology in particular got, got onwards. Yeah, so I did my undergrad in physics. So I did my for two years at a community college, and I really just fell in love with the subject of physics there. And then I ended up going to Florida Tech, which as <laughs> we didn't cross paths there. But um, but um, and I, I majored in physics, and I was doing research in a group um, that did experimental particle physics. But I really wanted to do theory because the thing that really got me excited about physics in the first place was that we could describe the world using mathematics and in, in fact that we could predict things that we don't even understand if they exist yet. And so the 
that to me was really the most beautiful and fascinating thing about doing physics. And I, so I really wanted to be a theorist. And so when I was looking for grad schools, I was looking for places I could do like fundamental physics, like early universe cosmology theory or particle physics. And I ended up going to grad school um, at Dartmouth College. And when I started working there, my PhD advisor um, was kind of, uh, he's sort of a broad thinker um, and had focused most of his career on an early universe, but started getting interested in astrobiology around the time I started working with him. And I didn't even know what astrobiology was. Um, so he's like trying to convince me to work on this subject. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this before. And, I, I, and so I actually, what I ended up doing was I started working on projects in astrobiology, but in parallel doing some cosmology. And I kept thinking that I was going to really develop the cosmology into my thesis and the astrobiology was just something I was doing in the short term. But it ended up being a total reversal. And in part that happened because I was working on origins of life and I really realized that this was like a place where we really didn't have any fundamental conceptual understanding of the problem or how to ask the right questions about the problem. And it was a place I saw um, physics really being able to contribute um, to some understanding of fundamental principles or universal principles for life in the universe. And that got me really excited because the whole reason I wanted to be a physicist in the first place was I was like in love with these major scientific revolutions and, and advances in our understanding like quantum mechanics or general relativity that really changed everything about how we think. And so the idea that we could have a theory of life and it might equally change everything about how we think is to me just so fascinating. Um, so I don't think that I really, um, like ideologically, my interests didn't change much, it's just that the questions evolved and, and I just found this area of astrobiology to be so rich for exploration and creativity and contributing new ideas. So you found a community of people, of like-minded yeah. individuals who are interested in the origin of life but coming at it from a different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's kind of what got SagaNet going. Um, so do you interact with scientists from a bunch of different disciplines to help you advance your science today? Yeah, I do. Um, so so actually, one of the reasons I really fell in love with astrobiology in particular when I was a grad student was because of the sense of community and the exposure to people from all kinds of different disciplines. Um, and, and I also really like that about being at ASU because it's a really unique place, like the School of Earth and Space Exploration. I'm in a department with geologists and astrophysicists, and I'm really neither of those things, but somehow still fit in the eclectic mix of people. So. Um, I, I do a lot of work um, in complex system science, which is very broad and interdisciplinary, and that's more like a mathematical set of tools. So I in, interact a lot with complexity scientists um, who are thinking about life. I interact a lot with people that think about exoplanets, so it would be more on exo, um, astrophysics, um, a lot of theoretical physicists, um, a lot of biologists, a lot of chemists for original life stuff, sometimes computer scientists. Um, so it's pretty much if there is a discipline that exists, I think I have worked with somebody in that field, which is, I think, the best thing about philosophers. It's just it's it's so incredibly broad this question of understanding life that I think it really it requires involving as much breadth of expertise as you possibly can. So during your university career, I was wondering if you benefited from from person you could look up to, like mentors who helped you guide through the the most, what must have been quite a non-linear thought process of going through school that you had. Yeah, it, it was, it was non-linear at the time, but so I am like looking at it backwards, I feel like there was actually like a clear trajectory, but um, yeah, so, so mentors are incredibly important, and in particular having mentors that are really supportive and are willing to um, you know, let you explore the questions that you're most passionate about and really go after them. And so for me, I was incredibly lucky through my graduate education, my undergrad, also I had a really good mentor in undergrad, and my graduate education and my postdocs to have really good mentors that were really encouraging of me asking really deep fundamental questions. And in particular, um, one person who's inspired me a lot was my, my postdoc advisor here is he was Paul Davies, um, because he encouraged me like no one else to really go after the really hard questions. And I think that's a really um, important thing to instill on early career researchers because um, oftentimes when you're at the earliest stages in your career, you have the most creativity and the innovative ideas, but you're often encouraged not to go after those things and to be safe and to save your career, whereas you might have the most potential for impact if you, you actually go after those things. So I think the experience of having a mentor who 
was enthusiastic for me really going after the really tough questions, really changed everything about what I could accomplish in my career and, and how I was going after things. It's also probably quite a bit more rewarding to take a bit more risks in your research, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which... I think so. so. Um, for me, it's more personally rewarding, but it is scary. I mean, so so there's always this, this challenge that you have to make it in science. And obviously, you're in science because you love it, so you want to stay in it. So it's, it's sort of like it feels like a catch-22. But I think... Um, at least in my experience, when people are like original and true to themselves and really go after the things that they, they care about, that's when their talent is, you know, like at its at, at its best, where they like really shine. So I think it it's it behooves us to, to try to train our like people to find what their passion is and follow it. And so really some make wise those, words. Yeah. For those of you watching, don't take life too much coasting, right? Take the chance to take a few risks. It'll be rewarding. So in the decades of origin of, of life research, there's been kind of two camps that have developed, right? There have been kind of the metabolism first people, which you describe as kind of the analog origin of life, and the genetics first origin of life camp, which is kind of the digital uh, origin of life approach. Um, but you have some new thoughts on how to think about these two camps, merging them into a way that that if you've published about kind of an algorithmic origin of life. Um, could you describe a little bit more, more about what that sure, entails? Yeah. Um, so, so the main so the main question that really drives me is with the origin of life question in particular is we're talking about life originating, but we don't really have a clear idea of what we mean by life, and that's very problematic if you want to build a theory for origins of life. Um, and so, from the perspective of physics, which obviously is, is my training and, and biases the way I'm thinking, and it's always really good to be aware of those biases. But from that perspective, the things that seem most unique about living systems are their ability to manage and process information, and in particular, use information um, and so um, what I've been trying to think about a lot over my career is how we might use the concept of information as a way to actually quantify the origin of life transition and how that might um, provide us a more rigorous set of mathematical tools for talking about life the conditions under which it might arise and, and how likely life is um, and from that perspective it's really nice because if you start thinking about like our traditional um, divisions that we have about thinking about biology, genetics, or metabolism, which are really just sort of, um, I mean, they are very different, fundamentally different processes in biology, but they're also partitions that we, are, are ways of partitioning the world that we ascribe to the world. It's not that nature necessarily has the same categories that we make. Um, so, so, I, so the idea being that some of these things that are very biologically relevant, like genetics and metabolism, might not be very different at the origins because those concepts are very biological. And in particular, that they have, if you, if you use this language of thinking about information, there's a common way of describing both of them that becomes a very natural way of, of describing them when they're, when they're not so different, and that they might be two aspects, for example, of, of information processing, one being digital and one being analog. Um, and so that's really kind of the idea is, is to try to look for the unifications rather than the divisions, I guess. So it's thinking about life as a transmitter of information. It's how information is transferred in what we call a living system that characterizes life from non-life. Is that right? Right, right. That's very fascinating. So that's, that's a very universal way of thinking about life. You know, when we, when we talk about the, the current 2018 way of searching for life on other worlds, it's a, it's a very, I guess, it's a very traditional way of looking for life, looking for life as we know it on Earth, right? But it's not necessarily that life is Earth-based. And so there were, a couple of years ago, I'm sure you know, there was the, the weird life report from the National Academies that identified kind of four universal, universalities of life. What were they? Thermodynamic equilibrium, liquid environment, molecular system of capable of Darwinian evolution, and then an environment that can sustain covalent bonds. But you're, you're doing research to, to look for other universal, universalities of life, right? Tell us more about that. That's right. Um, so, so there's a couple of qualifying statements I'll make about like my views. So, so one of the things people people often um, before I get to kind of addressing your question, but it's relevant. Um, so there's a, when I talk about like the distinction between life and non-life, people think I'm trying to talk about like a hard boundary between life. Life is this, and not life is this. But the actual thing that I think is happening is that we don't understand the physics of information period and that if we really want to understand how information operates in the physical world and how it, 
and how it manifests, that the best place to study that is biology. And it's sort of the analogy I like to make is if you think about gravitation as a physical law, um, you might... If you want to study gravitation, a really good place to study gravitation and limits of gravitation or what gravitation is capable of is to study black holes. If you want to study information in the physical world and how information operates in physical reality, you study life. And, and the laws of information are probably the laws of life. Um, and so, um, so that's sort of my perspective on that. And then if you're thinking about it from that very sort of broad universal perspective, it opens up entirely new ways of thinking about life that aren't necessarily our traditional ones that we think about in astrobiology. So for example, most of the things that you mentioned in those four criteria are based on thinking about life as a property of chemical organization. And we tend to think about life as a, a chemical phenomena because life emerges from chemistry, but it might not be that life is actually chemical in, in any sense. Um, and so what I mean by that is one of the places I look for inspiration most in thinking about organization of living systems and behavior of living systems is not necessarily chemistry, but social systems. Because social systems are highly organized, um, there's a lot of information in social systems that helps organize them. And there's a lot of ways of understanding ourselves at that kind of level of organization and to me that that system is just as much alive as a chemical organization inside myself it's just a different scale um, and so understanding what properties of information if you want to call it that or organizing principles um, operate across these scales that we see in living systems that are common across those scales is probably going to be our best bet for identifying universal properties of life that are likely to apply elsewhere in the universe, even if it's radically different chemistry. Fascinating. So do you think there is a universal theory of life, like there is a theory of gravitation? I hope so. <laughs> um, I don't know if there is. My suspicion is that there probably is. I mean, there's something fundamentally weird about life, and it's not it, it doesn't, in my mind, it does not demand a trivial explanation. It demands a profound one. And I think that, um, and, and that's just my own personal bias. So again, I think that when we're thinking about these questions, especially when they're, they're very deeply conceptual and they're things that, you know, are, are, are so intrinsic to understanding ourselves that we have to be careful about our biases. But, um, but living systems are very weird. They're very um, interesting and special. It's, it's very unique that, for example, we have scientists on Earth that can understand how the world works. There's um, the example that I really like is, is thinking about quantum mechanics. There's no evolutionary advantage to our ability to think, to, to have knowledge of the laws of quantum mechanics. None whatsoever. Yet somehow we have this deep knowledge, we have information about the inner workings of reality and the scale that is almost completely irrelevant to, to our daily operation. Um, and those kind of things you know, like it's easy to sweep those things under the rug and say, oh, those are not important things, but, but they seem very critical to addressing these kind of questions. Um, so, yeah, so I, cool. I think so. I hope so. <laughs> so that would mean that there is new physics yet to be discovered to understand the theory of life, right? Something that was as mysterious as quantum mechanics, thinking about it in the, you know, 18th century. Yes, that's my hope. That's, um, wow. Yeah. Fantastic. So your research has taken also, with the same philosophy, taken another spin and more applied to the search for life on, on exoplanets, for example. So currently we search for life on, on exoplanets, we will at least, uh, by looking at the products of biology, right? So if you look at Earth atmosphere from far away, for example, you recognize an oxidant, oxygen, and a reductant, methane. And the fact that you have both of them in our atmosphere suggests that there's a process on the surface that is uh, actively uh, you know, producing those those two chemicals that would react otherwise. And so when thinking about life on, on those other planets, that's kind of the strategy that is going to be put forward in the next decade or two. And um, But you're thinking about it differently, right? You're thinking about uh, using statistics as a means to infer the, the possibility of life just from observing what you can't observe on the planet. Yeah, so I, I've gotten really intrigued by the exoplanet discoveries recently and, and looking for life on exoplanets because of the, the issue of statistics. So so one of my reasons is really selfish and it has nothing to do with wanting to discover life, but I want like I want bounds for theory development. Like we don't understand how frequent life is. So if we had some understanding of at least the distribution of planets that can't 
harbor life, that would be more information than we have, or don't harbor life. Um, so that's um, sort of that, that we need more information for understanding life more broadly and, and how it's distributed. So that was my original kind of thinking for getting into exoplanet um, biosignature research. But the thing that um, I've been working on more actively um, uh, is actually thinking about uh, like planetary systems and how they organize. And so um, when we're talking about biology from this kind of ab abstract perspective, perspective. One of the ways that we try to uh, build mathematical structures to describe that is by um, using networks. Um, so the familiar example actually probably to everyone on SagaNet um, is a social network because we're part of a social network being here on SagaNet and um, and some of you that are logged in are probably friends with each other on SagaNet and so so you can actually represent SagaNet as a network um, where all the people logged in would be nodes and you know if they're con friends with each other they would be connected and you can represent chemistry this way too um, and so what has been shown in the past with some preliminary analysis is that you actually can potentially Essentially, um, look at the network structure of Earth's atmosphere and see that has distinct structure from atmospheres of other uh, planets in our solar system. So, if you if you run an atmospheric model and then you look at the structure of the chemical network in the atmosphere, they look different for Earth than they do from other planets. And it's intriguing because Earth's differences make it look more like the structure of networks and metabolism inside cells than, than it does like other atmospheric networks. So it looks like life has sort of globally organized the statistical properties of chemical reaction networks in Earth's atmosphere in a way that is a biosignature. Um, and so we're actually working on trying to see how rigorous that assessment is because it's been very preliminary analysis that people have done so far. Um, and the goal is that if you were looking at an atmosphere that you wouldn't just necessarily identify the molecules, but you actually could look at the pattern of organization in the atmosphere as the biosignature. And, and that seems more intuitive in terms of the way we usually talk about biology as being, you know, ordered or this, you know, patterns of organization. Um, and so it's kind of trying to step toward that in a more quantitative way um, from, from what we have right now. So that framework you're building really requires a strong cooperation between physicists like you who build kind of the statistics model and also the astronomers who will be looking for the signatures, the yeah. atmospheric modelers yeah. will be modeling to be able to say something about the, probability, the likelihood of such atmospheres yeah. which are constrained by geological yeah. measurements. Right. And so this, right. this, is, this is awesome, like it's really like the quest to understand life on Earth is a quest that requires all of us on Earth to be involved in, in answering, right? It's, it's, it's philosophically magnificent. Yeah. And so what are the implications yeah. of that um, beyond from a scientific perspective, but on what it means to be humans are, are also, uh, also, you know, kind of mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, so, so I think, I'm oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I think the thing that I like most about my job is working with different people. And in particular, like the students and postdocs in my group are so diverse and they all have like such brilliant ideas to contribute all the time that it's just like, it's so cool to follow the paths of things that they're, they're proposing. So, um, yeah, so it's just, it's so cool. <laughs> it just shows that you can seek those the answers to such fundamental questions from as the origin of life. You don't necessarily need to be in a lab and try to replicate. You can have these broader thoughts on how to basically def try to define what life is. You, is. Is there a definition, do you think? Well, so my feeling is a definition for, should derive from a theory. Um, and so oftentimes, in, in particularly in astrobiology, and we've tried to start from definitions and then try to infer properties of life. And 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 there have been arguments against that approach that really we need to start with theories um, and then and then derive definitions from those theories. And and that's really an approach that I can get behind. So I think the thing that I think about is like what are the first what are the axioms of life or the first starting principles that you would reason to build a theory and then try to build that theory and see what it tells you about life. And presumably those should be testable hypotheses. Um, yeah. Oh. <clears throat> so don't forget, for those of you who are watching, use hashtag AskAstrobio to ask some questions or use the SigaNet chat directly. We'll be opening up the floor for questions for you all in a, in a few minutes. But I wanted to chat about something else, if you, do, if you don't mind, because 
you're kind of almost a superhero, right? You're, you do incredible science. You publish really thought-provoking papers that are changing the way we think about problems that we've been working on for decades. Your research group is, has over 10 people, I think, now. You're teaching classes, and you're, you're the mom of two wonderful kids. Tell me your secret on how you manage your time. <laughs> to be perpetually stressed? <laughs> No, actually, I, I mean, I think the thing is that I really love what I do, so it's okay, but it's exhausting. I, I mean, if I'm going to be blatantly honest, I'm pretty tired all the time. But um, but I think the thing um, that uh, really motivates me is I really love what I do. And I also really love my kids and my family, so I, I have to try to make sure that I, like, balance my time accordingly. Um, and sometimes that can be easier than others because sometimes everything wants to demand your attention at once, and sometimes... Well, I must say sometimes there's a break, but there's not really a break. Um, but yeah, so um, so I think that's also like goes back to my um, advice at the beginning about following things that you're really passionate about. If you if you really care about the things you work on, um, even if there there might be things that are really challenging about your job or you have to juggle a lot of things, um, it makes it worthwhile. So I would I, I would obviously not have as much high energy or or be as I guess productive if I didn't care about the things that I work on so much. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. But but with two little kids, it, it, it's difficult. Like I, I got up at like well, I something I learned from four this morning to get up so I could do stuff before they got up. But then I couldn't get up, so I got up at five. I got forty five minutes though. But like so that's like a you know it's like you know you kind of <laughs> I know I'm like this sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Um, <laughs> it's not very atypical either, but. Um, yeah, I, I just, I really like it. <laughs> Your enthusiasm is contagious, Sarah. It's, it's yeah. just fantastic. <laughs> so um, I wanted to plug in your, your book that you just released fairly recently on Cambridge University Press called From Matter to Life. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so I think, um, so a lot of times when I talk to people about like this kind of perspective on life and stuff, they think that's like, um, you know, it's a, it's, it is a really new perspective, but there are a lot of really good people working on thinking about what life is in, in, in a fundamental way and trying to build new ways of thinking about it, um, in particular from the information perspective, but just more broadly. And so the idea with that book was really to try to get some of these people that are really contributing great thoughts to this literature to to write um, pieces on what they were thinking for this collection so that we could have a group of essays that were really representing the state of the field as far as how we're thinking about life and how to approach it from um, more quantitative directions and more ways of thinking more rigorously about some of these philosophical concepts that have been um, maybe a little bit hairy and so we have contributions from people across the spectrum of sciences um, and philosophy um, contributing to it so um, it was really exciting to work on <laughs> it was a lot of work um, but I'm really glad that I did it um, because it, it was a really fun project to do and it's really cool to see all of those things together and it was super fun for me to read everybody else's contributions yeah, it's a great contribution as a whole. Um, so let's let's open it up the questions for now. I'm sure all of you online have, have dying to ask Dr. Walker some some insightful questions. Uh, again, use hashtag Ask Astrobio on Twitter to let us know about your questions, or use a thing in the chat uh, directly. So the first question comes from Motor Protein, and um, so we talked a little bit about uh, that question and during our conversation, Sarah. But they want to know how does one get into the origin of life research, and does one need to be you know, in biology to do that. Yeah, so no, you don't necessarily need to be in biology. And I think the thing to do is to show up <laughs> and start doing it. Um, I, so so my path was kind of um, a little unusual because I was in a, a PhD program in physics and my advisor just started working on origins of life when I started working on it. Um, so most of the way, like when I was applying for jobs and things, I actually really had to go out on my own and go to conferences and like meet people and talk to them and try to get them excited about the ways I was thinking about the problem. Um, and I remember like a few of the conferences I went to, I was I was like one of two physicists or theorists in the room because mostly origins of life has been uh, predominantly organic chemists and people thinking about prebiotic chemistry. Um, and so, um, so I really just had to 
uh, be very persistent. And in fact, I will tell you, don't let anybody tell you you can't do Origins of Life for a career if you really care about it. Because somebody told me in grad school, was a very prominent Origin of Life researcher, that I should get out of the field now because I, there's no hope of a career in it because there are no jobs in Origins of Life. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I always draft, joke about that, and I tell that story to, like, everyone. But I think it's really like in retro, like at the time I was mortified. I remember like I was a grad student and you know, I'm in a cosmology group. I want to do origins of life and I'm at this conference, like try to talk to people. So I like go back in my room and I'm like crying about it. And I'm like, I'm never going to get a job. It's never to get a postdoc and all this stuff. But, um, but I, I, you know, the next day I went and talked to more people and, and I actually ended up getting a job out of that conference. So, um, so it, I think it, it takes a lot of persistence. I, original life obviously is not, you know, a field that's in every department. Um, but even if, like, you get into an undergrad program or a grad program and there's not anybody explicitly working on origins of life, you can try to direct your program into things that are you think are going to be relevant and try to read the relevant literature and steer yourself in that direction and start trying to connect with people who are in the origins of community. So I think with all these things, it's really about your passion and your drive. Um, and and, and all the other things follow after that. Great, thanks. Rashi asks uh, about something we've talked about also, about your search for this theory of life. Um, are you, does it keep you up at night? Um, it used to more than it does now. Uh, I, I guess maybe I've been thinking about it long enough that I'm not so worried about it. I guess the one thing I worry about is like, that I might never see it. Um, so like, yeah, and actually some of my students joke that, like, if they ever figure out what life is, they're not going to tell me. <laughs> it's, like, the worst thing ever. Um, so, um, so it, I, I, I mean, I think about it a lot. I think about it at odd times. So it might be, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the car with my family. They pick me up from work, and I still have, like, my head in the clouds about, like, thinking about things or, like, pop in when I'm, like, reading my kids at night. But, um, but I think that's because, like, when you're working in creative spaces and, and it requires a lot of mental power, you can't really get your head out of it. So... Um, but I don't, I don't like sit awake at night wondering things usually unless, well, occasionally I do, but it's usually very more specific, not kind of general things. Um, I hear yeah. I think I have my, my, my personal scientific insights come from when I'm not at work, strangely enough. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Stuff, so, um, so Rohan, uh, asks, uh, in which areas of astrobiology do you think artificial intelligence will be most useful? Yeah, um, so this is a great question. Um, I mean, the ones I've thought about the most are origins of life research because there there's the ability with AI to um, to enhance like exploration of chemical space with like chemical robotics type things, and people are publishing on that now. Um, and uh, exoplanet research with trying to like mine large data sets very rapidly, and um, and I think also even just understanding evolution better, like looking for patterns in the history of the coupled biological and geological record. I mean, we have massive data, and trying to make sense of that is difficult. So I think I think AI and machine learning are going to be really important for those kind of questions as well. So I, I, I think, like most fields of science, it's going to be a major revolution for us in astrobiology in the coming decade. Um, as far as our, our methods. Cool. Um, Suraj asks, what language do you code in and what computer science subject do you use in your day-to-day -day work? Oh my, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends. So I use Python personally, but I get made fun of by some people. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So yeah, so most of the people in my, in my research group also use Python, but we have a couple of people that use Julia, and I've been trying to wait to see like when the phase transition is going to happen from Python to Julia, because they're very convincing that Julia is better, which I, I don't even really understand the details. But um, uh, So I use Python personally, but we, we use a lot of different kinds of things in our work, because I... Like, we work a lot on origins of life, but we work across all scales of biological organization. And depending on the system, different methods are needed. So um, so there was just a question about, like, machine learning and doing those kind of techniques. And I have a, a student that's very into AI, and he's basically taught himself, like, that entire field, and he's amazing. Um, and then I, we work on ants, and we needed something to be able to track the ants so that we could actually do information measures on ant behavior, because we want to understand how information might structure collective behavior 
um, in ant colonies. And so, um, so he ended up building uh, some deep learning algorithms for us to track the ants. Um, and so that's just like one example of, of sort of cross-disciplinary work just in our own research group as far as, you know, like somebody working on something totally distinct, helping with another project. Um, and I, I think that's really cool. Um, and so I don't, I think one of the things um, that is the best skill set as a programmer or somebody interested in computational methods is just to be adaptable and be able to learn new techniques. Um, and also to be able to code with other people. So one of the things that I think is most exciting about the students and postdocs I work with is how much they like to work together, which is super cool because they're they're like so creative when they get together in groups and like try to figure stuff out and they do a lot of coding together and developing the software packages and stuff and those end up being very useful like to the whole group and so I think that's been really um, powerful and important for our research as far as being able to do more collectively <laughs> than we would ever do individually um, which is always the great thing about working with other people. You're talking like an astrobiologist. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Julia de Marine asks, tell us more about the difference between living systems and non-living systems that you study. Right, so, um, so what do I, so is this sort of a sneaky way of asking me what I think the difference between life and non-life is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so I, it's a great question. Um, so I, I think the key differences go to, to information, but that, that's actually a really loaded word. And so um, there are like a million definitions for how people think about information that range from things that are trying to capture its meaningful aspects or semantic aspects or to like the way Shannon uh, quantified information theory is like communication on a noisy channel and all of those things are sort of relevant. Um, but the thing that I think is, is really important um, and, and might be useful for purposes of discussion, although I have never figured out really how to formulate this in the right way in my own mind, is that the concept that's really relevant to biology is not necessarily information, but knowledge. And that seems like a subtle distinction, but the thing that's intriguing about biological systems is they have models of their world or knowledge of the external world, and they can actually use that knowledge. Um, so the example I, I give, which seems very far from origins of life, but as my favorite example, um, is to think about like launching satellites into space. And so um, we do that as a technological civilization um, now. Um, and, and the reason I think this is a re relevant example because Earth has thousands of satellites orbiting it right now. But if you think about Earth without life or Earth without technology, we have the moon as the only satellite, the only natural satellite orbiting Earth. And so basically what our civilization has accomplished is making more artificial satellites than natural satellites for Earth. Now that's interesting because those natural satellites would never exist unless there was a technological, I mean those artificial satellites would never exist unless there was a civilization with knowledge of the laws of gravitation. So we figured out something about the world, about how the world works, and we used it to create this new thing, this, this possibility of Earth having thousands of satellites, whereas natural processes might give it one or a few. Um, and I think that's, that is very telling of the most intrinsic property of life. It's not just that it takes information or that it uses information, but it actually uses that information to generate novelty, to generate things that wouldn't exist without that information. And that's sort of the cascading process that the biosphere has been doing over 4 billion years. Um, and so that's the process that we need to understand is that extended structure of acquiring knowledge and using it to generate new possibilities over time. This, this leads... That's my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish this show was like three hours long for every one of our guests. It's always such a fascinating conversation. Um, so th this question about information uh, translates a little bit to the next question by Ben Pierce, who asks, you mentioned describing life as information transfer. When imagining mm -hmm. the units of information being transferred, are you thinking about information polymers or other non-genetic types of information? Um, it could be non-genetic. I mean, certainly I am transferring information to everyone right now, and I would by no means say that's genetic information, but I think it's important information and it's relevant. And, it, and so the interesting thing about information that I think is um, not as appreciated, um, unless you think about it a lot, is that information has this property that it can be um, 
it can mean the same thing even though it might be in diff different physical hardware. So, so I'm talking now and some, you know, my information is entering my speakers and it's transferring like all the way to you guys and then being output and, and distributed through the air to your ears and then you're getting the information and you're understanding it somehow in your brain. So there's a lot of different kinds of physical media that information moved through um, and the information is not necessarily an intrinsic property of any one of them. Um, it's more about how that signal is propagated through those systems and how you as a, a receiver or somebody that can understand what I'm saying <laughs> actually interpret that information. And so that's the more critical aspect. So we tend to think about like DNA as having information. DNA doesn't have information. It has, um, it, it, at best you can think about storing information, but it doesn't really do anything until it's read out. And that's actually when it is information is when it's controlling something about the cellular state. Um, and so that kind of process actually can happen in chemistry. It can happen in computers. It can happen in ant colonies. Um, so so there, it, it's a more ubiquitous process than just being tied to thinking about genetics. Fascinating. Eduardo Rodriguez Roman asks about your personal definition of life, or you have one, or maybe you don't because that would bias your research. <laughs> Um, no, I, I do. I do have a personal definition, but it evolves as a function of time. And actually, one of my favorite things to do, and we haven't done this in a while, but in my research group is to have a what is life discussion and everybody has to write their definition on the board. So like I get held to having to write a definition too. So it's kind of funny because nobody wants to like say what their definition is and then they're pinned to it. Um, and they change all the time. So my definition today might be different than tomorrow. Um, but I think... Um, uh, so, so one thing I think is a, a common misconception is we think of life more like a thing than a process. And so um, what I think life is, is when information matters to systems and actually is important for, um, for, let me try to think about how to say this. <laughs> um, yeah. When, it, it's sort of like like life is a property that's distributed in space and time, and the, the, the structure of that system is actually set by how information is flowing in that system. So that, that seems very abstract, but, but basically it means when information actually matters to the world, it's life um, in a way that is reproducible. Um, nice. Yeah, so, so obviously very abstract and needs articulation. Um, <laughs> No, that's great. It's a great way to, to think differently about something we've been thinking similarly for yeah. the past few decades. So it's just setting us on a new course. I think it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things like it, it's that, and that's why it's hard. It's like there's not really a clear boundary to that process because it's, it's a dynamical process that has to involve with it, and it's about the structure of that process. Yeah, that's what makes it so hard and why origins of life research are really important. It's essentially job yeah, security yeah, yeah. because the problem is so hard. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> So Nitin asks, how can we use microbes to tackle mm -hmm. origin of life research? Oh, microbes are fantastic. So, um, so I think uh, one of the things that's really been interesting for me, thinking about using um, current biology to understand origins of life, is to think about, in this kind of abstract sense, like how are living systems processing information? What are they doing? And also how... Um, the structure of systems, like what might be the the things that are universal across all life, um, and also how that is tied to the environment. So that seems like a whole bunch of things. Somehow my brain, those are all related. Um, but um, but the idea is, um, if you if you say take a, a microbe and you want to look at um, how it's working. Um, Usually we, what we do right currently is like try to look at all the individual parts and then we build up the system from there. But you can actually also look at it at a systems level and look at the organization of that system and how information is flowing in that system. And so that's one way of trying to understand um, what that system is from a form, more fundamental perspective. But just to give you a more concrete example, um, because I've been talking kind of very abstractly, but we do do a lot of concrete work in my group. It's just trying to give the sort of high-level picture while also resolving details is very challenging in the short time we have. But um, uh, 
But a lot of um, people work in, um, you know, like hot spring ecosystems and things, and they're studying like whole communities. And I think that kind of work, as far as like how microbes are interacting with their environment and things, is very um, important for understanding what the early drivers of the emergence of those kind of systems might have been. Um, and so one of the things that um, we're really interested in doing is looking at the structure of networks in those systems and how those networks actually couple to the geochemical context. And so that's one way of trying to actually really look at like the planetary drivers of processes, which would actually hopefully help illuminate how those kind of systems emerged in the first place. That's why studying uh, microbes in hot springs, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> is <important>. what is that? <laughs> um, Carl Filcher has the next question, and he asks, how do you connect the, the thermodynamic drivers for the origin of life, in parentheses, relaxation pathways for planetary chemical disequilibrium, with your perspective on information as central to the nature of life? Yeah, so, so I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately, and there's a couple of things that I think are really promising in that direction. One is a field that I'm not so familiar with, but I've been trying to like learn more about, which is that there's been some really fascinating and deep work in non-equilibrium thermodynamics um, about what information is in the thermodynamic sense. Um, and so um, so there have been some, some new innovations about information actually being a way of extracting work. Um, and so that seems to have relevance for origins of life where we want to talk about these thermodynamic processes driving the system, but ultimately somehow we have to transition to an informational narrative to be consistent with biology. And so I've been trying to do some work on importing some of those ideas into how we think about original life models and other people have been doing those kind of things, which I think is really exciting work. Um, the other one is um, that we've been doing some work with um, biochemical networks and their organization. And I think there is a way of thinking about those um, in terms of of flows of electrons, which is like redox is what usually people think about. And there's natural analogies there between the structure of biochemistry and, and the structure of computer architecture and how electrons are flowing through computers and what those networks look like. And so I've been trying to actually explore those kind of analogies as far as if we think about redox and how redox gradients might have structured life on a planet, that maybe that's really a kind of, you could think of that as a kind of computation and the emergence of a computational system. Um, so I think that, that, that that's also this part where we think about information as being genetics, but it could be much earlier than that, and it might just be embedded in the structure of the way these reaction networks organize, that they really are doing these kind of informational processes from the start. That's a good question, Carl. <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> Suraj asks, um, th th does your research help understand uh, the hierarchy of biology that develops following the start? Yeah. So. I am fascinated by that question. Like most physicists, I tend to obsess about hierarchies. I don't, I don't know what it is with the way our brains are trained, but hierarchies are fascinating. And a lot of people from like the physics side think that the hierarchy of biology is actually the hardest problem of understanding life, and that's where most of the fundamental physics is, is explaining that hierarchy. Um, because that's where you start to get information flows that are not necessarily just bottom up, but top down information flows, like the, the, the example that is the most abstract and philosophical is that your brain has thoughts and those actually control your actions. So it's a very high level process controlling a low level process. But we see that across the hierarchy. So I'm really interested in why new levels emerge, what they're doing, and, and also how they change the structure of lower levels um, by the kind of constraints they impose. And one place that we've been looking at that is with biochemical networks. Um, more generally and showing that if you look at, at the structure from like an abstract network perspective, individuals don't look very, like they scale the same way as ecosystems and that structure actually seems to extend all the way to the biosphere as a whole. So there, there's a very regular structure across the hierarchy of individuals, ecosystems, biosphere, as far as how biochemistry is organized globally. And I think that's a really fascinating window into this problem of hierarchy and how living systems organize across scales. Cool. It's a really good question. If any of you are interested in working on hierarchies, you should. They're very tough. <laughs> <clears throat> Ioannis Tamvakis asks, Hi, Sarah. I have a possible generic life quantification metric that I'm working on. And uh, I was, was wondering if you have anything along these lines that you're thinking of as well. So, um, I, I'm interested in quantifying life, but as I said, I don't um, I don't think of life as a static property. So I think most of the, I, I don't know anything about your measure. I think it's fascinating that you have one, so that's awesome, um, and you should keep developing it. Um, but I I guess um, 
I think that you can measure um, like how alive a system is, but but it would be something about the dynamical structure of that system. Um, and that's all I can say at, at this exact juncture in time, as far as my thinking. Richard Gordon asks, what are your thoughts on oil droplets, origin of life? I like oil droplets. They're fun to watch scurry around <laughs> petri dishes. Um, I, I, so, so something that, that probably annoys some people is that I'm very agnostic about the chemistry that started life. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a preference of like oil droplets first or metabolism first or genetics first. I really just want, I want to understand the processes that give rise to living systems. And they might, in my mind, they could manifest in a lot of different chemical systems. And this might be why we have promising leads on lots of different kinds of chemistry being the first step. Um, and so... Um, so from the sense that they have, um, they can exhibit lifelike behavior and those kind of things, I'm interested in how chemistry can organize to do that. Um, but the oil droplets themselves, I, I don't have a preference on whether that's the exact model for origins of life on Earth. Lee Cronin might disagree. <laughs> uh, Maya oreskovich Igrich asks, I've been writing a sci-fi story where a planetary sci artists assesses planets based on initial conditions and one estimates the possibility the possible evolutionary scenarios and life forms that can or will live on that planet will that ever be possible to do or is it just sci-fi at this stage um it depends on what you mean by possible so so there's there's possible and that we don't have the knowledge to do it or there's possible that it's actually physically possible to predict and i'm on the line that it's not physically possible to predict um, because if you if you look at, I, I guess the reason I, I take that perspective is that I really do think that biology genuinely generates novelty and it's not necessarily, so, so um, I, I know I've been using kind of technical language and we're trying to avoid it, but it's hard in these concepts. Um, but, um, but if you think about like what is possible, physicists usually like to iterate a finite set of things, but it, it Biology seems to generally create things that are new and, and maybe aren't anticipated. So I think we can understand the process of generating those new things, but not the specific new things that are generated. They can't predict the future, essentially, of what life is going to do because it's so stochastic. Yeah, so I, I think whatever the evolutionary process is, if, if we can understand that at a more fundamental level, is universal. And so you might understand the conditions on, under which you start that process, origins of life. But predicting where that process is going is very difficult. Um, and so just to give you an example, like if we invent AI, um, I mean, we're heading there. Uh, it's really difficult for us to anticipate what's that, what's that going to do? Um, because there's so many possibilities that it actually can do predicting which one. I don't, I don't actually think it's a state, it's a statement that we, we could predict ahead. I think we can predict general trends, but not specifics. That makes sense. Jacob Hackmistra asks, are stars alive? Stars. Oh, that's a great question. Um, not in my mind. Um, although, so so this is where it gets really murky. So so people talk about stars being alive because they undergo an evolutionary process. So you have a star, and it burns all its fuel, and it dies, and it spreads new elements out into the universe, and then it, that enriches the next generation of stars and might change their properties, and then that can happen again. So it looks like there's even an evolutionary inheritance there. But I don't take an evolutionary definition of life. I take this kind of informational one, and, and there seems to be no real... Um, uh, information necessary for that process. But that being said, um, I think this is one of the things that's sort of a gray area because I think there are plenty of things that are very close to being alive or almost alive and that then there are things that we qualify as alive. But I don't think that that boundary between those is, is well defined. And I don't think that that's because we don't have a good definition for it. I just think it's not a well-defined boundary because that's not really the right question to ask. The question is to ask what are the processes that drive increasing, um, increasingly complex and rich information processing structures in nature and how do those arise? Um, and, and if you want to trace that process all the way back to its root, I guess you better go all the way back to the Big Bang because it's, it's a process that emerges from nature. It's not a, it's not a hard boundary. Um, so I'm not saying the origin of life was in the Big Bang. I'm just saying that, like, it's kind of a, it's it's a different way of thinking about the question. All right. Um, Nitin asks, 
What are your thoughts of DNA having a more prevalent role in, in computing in terms of memory oh, I think storage? It's super cool. Yeah, I think it's super cool that people are doing stuff with DNA computing. Um, I think, it's, I mean, it's just another piece of hardware. It's just a, a different one um, than what we're used to thinking about. So I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think it's necessarily like a, a major revolution in how we're thinking about computing or anything like that. But it is fun that we can do computation in DNA, and it might be useful to like programming biological systems and synthetic okay. biology. Oh, it's exciting the path that computation is taking for sure. Yeah. So here's a question that all of us who are fans of Firefly want to know, is how did you meet Nathan Fillion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was, uh, we have a, so we have this awesome thing at ASU, which is called the Center for Science and the Imagination, and they do all these kind of things with authors and scientists and, like, trying to, um, uh, you know, get science fiction to talk to science fact. Um, and so they were having a panel with uh, Nathan Fillion because he is a friend of affiliate of the center and um, and they were looking for scientists to be on it and so they asked me um, and that was really fun. Uh, it was a very lively conversation with a few scientists and Nathan and it was it was fun. Um, I had a good night. Is he as yeah. stubborn as he is in the show? Um, I'm just kidding. No, no I don't that. think so. I, I don't think so. I mean, that wasn't my impression. I think I, I think he's easily convinced by scientific evidence, which is good. Um, and also, just yeah, he has a very dynamic and charismatic personality, so he's very good at like engaging the audience, which I thought was cool. Um, Wonderful. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Sarah, we're at the top of the hour. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I know you're super busy. It was absolutely wonderful to have you. Thanks so much. I was really happy to be here and so excited to get all the wonderful questions. For those of you who are watching, catch us next month for Ask an Astrobiologist. Again, look at that background because that's going to be your question for next month's episode. And until then, stay curious. Do take care. Bye-bye.